Yeah, we should we should discuss more and so it's you on the moon. Yes. Charlotte. You can find me on Facebook. Or, yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, and we are in contact with a lot of, of professors and researchers. So if you need contacts, yeah. Yeah. we are working especially with professor men. It's from East Belgium. Jimen. Yeah, he's like super famous. And he's, he's trying to go against misunderstanding. Like, no, it's not going to be like international waves of migrants. It's like so it's, it's a good guy. <laughs> so, Francois is like. Sorry for my French. <laughs> yeah, and then it's G D E M M the double M. Yeah. And if you need us to put you in the same thing, we see him every day. Yeah, we had it like I had it as a teacher, and one of my friends is in the project. Uh, she's doing her. Excuse me. This is a uh, one catch box okay. for the Q and A session. Yeah. I checked the other one, but it, it seems not a work. Oh, it, okay. it doesn't make any sound. So I, I called the technician. Okay. No problem. Thanks. I'm just gonna put it on my computer because I'm gonna put them all in one presentation. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. It's, uh, it's uh, on the top layer. It's called Article Six on NDCs. Okay. So, the perfection. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, with this one, it, it works, but it doesn't work. Sorry? He needs only one. Oh! <laughs> That's it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, here in the Bond Room. Um, my name is Dirk Forrester, and I'm the CEO of IETA. Um, we asked the parties to close the Article 6 uh, roundtables today so that you would come to our side event 
No, we, we didn't do that. Um, <laughs> but we are, we are happy that uh, those of you that are interested in Article 6 that are unable to be part of the uh, roundtable today are um, able to join us here. We're going to have um, a variety of perspectives here on sort of the, the thinking that um, some outside observers are giving to uh, the development of Article 6. Uh, we hope to be joined by Ulrika Robb from the Swedish delegation to give us a little bit of a view from uh, uh, more of a governmental vantage point. Um, so hopefully she, I'm sure she's tied up in the other room, but hopefully she'll be able to extract herself and join us. Um, but uh, I guess to, to sort of tee it off, I'll give you just a, a little bit of a preview of um, how AIDA has been looking at this and, and just to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. And I think probably all of you uh, uh, are aficionados of Article 6 already and kind of understand this, but the key provisions in the article deal with um, sort of accounting treatment of uh, transferred mitigation outcomes, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, which primarily appears in uh, 6.2 and 6.3 of that article. Um, there's also a new mechanism to promote sustainable development and emissions mitigation that is, uh, uh, appears in Article 6.4, um, and it's got some uh, references to learning from the experiences of the past with the CDM and, and other Kyoto mechanisms. Um, so that, that is a, a topic in and of itself that's of great interest to a lot, to a lot of countries uh, in these talks. And then finally, it's rounded out with a, a, a provision on non-market approaches that encourages uh, um, way or encourages cooperation also in non-market approaches through development of some some form of a framework to support those activities. Um, so uh, the reason this is really important in the conversations this week and, and later this year is that this is one of those items in the uh, Paris Agreement that is, uh, has a shall uh, verb in front of it uh, of uh, completion of a work program for, for the non-market approaches of modalities and procedures for the, uh, the new mechanism and of guidance on, um, on the accounting treatment. Uh, and that's supposed to be done in 2018. So those of us that are interested in how this mechanism might influence the development of the markets of the future and their connectivity in the future, this is a really important provision and it's important to get those rules right. Um, so you'll know that in these talks this week, there's uh, two days of roundtables that are closed to, to uh, non-parties. So hence you're in this room. Uh, but um, coming up throughout the, this week and next, there will be other opportunities for the negotiators to actually talk substance on this and hopefully take things forward so that we get a sense of what the main topics are going to be um, in developing these three areas of work. Um, and maybe by the end of the year, we'll be getting some draft texts collected on how people think they should be um, be uh, sort of uh, fleshed out in words. Um, for for AITA, um, we're really interested in this because we think that the potential for trading of these uh, mitigation outcomes, ITMOs, uh, could be exponentially greater than the Kyoto trading uh, if it's done right. It could unleash quite a bit more investment and also enable us to get at projects that are of a much greater scale. Um, and that's going to happen, we think, through market linkages that have these robust accounting principles. And one of, one of the topics that I, I'm sure uh, some of our speakers will talk about is what does robust accounting mean in this context? But for, for us in the business community, it means that we want the system to have integrity. We want to be able to understand supply and demand <laughs> dynamics from the information that's being provided at the UN level. And we want to ensure that there's not the potential for introducing um, uh, sort of any, you could think of it as counterfeit currency into the system, but you want to make sure that the system is robust and assuring that you know where the flows are going and that only good stuff is in, in the system to begin with. 
Um, we're also quite interested in the new market mechanism or the new mitigation mechanism. Um, it's different this time in that it's available to any parties that want to use it, whether they're developed or developing. Um, we think this could be conceived of as something that's more than mere crediting. Um, crediting could be important for a lot of parties, we think especially smaller countries here. But it could also be the, um, uh, there's a possibility that this mechanism could be used to quantify a more ambitious program by a country. And you could imagine uh, a smaller country that might have interest in a more of an ETS style system over part of its uh, economy, over certain sectors of its, its economy. And perhaps this mechanism could be a place that that type of a contribution could be uh, brought forward. Um, and it could potentially give it a higher likelihood of gaining fungibility with other systems. Now there are there are some jurisdictions like those in North America right now or Europe or the one emerging in China that are large enough that they may be able to operate on their own, but for a lot of more middle income countries, they might like the ability to connect into a broader network of countries. And this mechanism could, um, could offer some benefits in that regard. Um, we also have interest, uh, again, longer term in the, some of the direct and indirect interests of uh, references to Red Plus. Um, again, looking forward over this issue for uh, the decades that are to come, um, our organization believes we're going to need all of these types of mitigation activities, including Red Plus as a storage uh, technique, as well as CCS, to be um, accounted for in these systems. Um, so we're interested in understanding how the open architecture of this article could enable that. Um, and finally, we, we like the aspect of uh, this being in a context where um, nationally determined contributions are being reviewed on a regular basis, and that will also give us information on supply and demand trends. We think there are a lot of countries that are interested in using this. This is probably a slide that you've seen AIDA produce before, but we've kind of uh, investigated with our friends at the Environmental Defense Fund who are in the room here, uh, uh, which NDCs have sort of expressed interest in use of market mechanisms. And come on in, Ulrika. I already told them you were coming. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, it's not okay. Sorry everyone. Um, but uh, uh, just to say that we think there's a set of countries that are interested in using it and are interested in this being a, a, a part of the way that they make, uh, make contributions. And I believe this is my, I'm getting toward the end of my slides, just to say that uh, uh, I think this, this actually highlights uh, things that have already been through about 6.2, 6.4, and 6.8, so I'm gonna skip past that and just say that at the end of the day, um, we're, we're coming to the conclusion as we really think about this internally and have our own discussions with, with uh, our member companies and, and with governments that this all comes back to quantification and the importance of this tool being something that assists parties in being able to quantify their actions to measure and verify those. We think that at a, at a minimum should be something that is um, useful for those for tracking those that have uh, uh, absolute targets uh, that are that are connected up through markets but we also think that maybe as a way of progressively moving in that direction it could also have the potential that I referenced already of um, a country bringing in maybe a sector at a time and and progressively improving that over time um, we also think that um, in order for this, these kinds of trading to take place, the quantification is sort of a necessary first element. It's very hard to trade something that you can't count. And so uh, in our vision, uh, this quantification is really something that's required upfront in the system so that we'll understand what's going on, um, market participants, and for building confidence in the system overall. Um, we also are interested in kind of understanding how the information that's gathered in Article 6 may relate to the transparency mechanism being negotiated in Article 13, which again could help bolster the credibility of the whole system. Um, and then our final point is throughout this uh, the Paris Agreement, you see references to double counting and the avoidance of double counting. And, and again, from our perspective, um, you'd have to count to know how to avoid the double count. So it all begins with that quantification at the beginning. So I hope that gives you just a little bit of a, 
uh, an overview, uh, at least at, at how AIDA is coming at this. Uh, but I think it'd be really useful now to draw in perspectives from other of the panelists. And I'm going to start with Christina Hood from the International Energy Agency. And Christina's, um, uh, well, whether she likes it or not, <laughs> she's become one of the, the, the true experts in thinking about uh, the accounting treatment and, and how do you assure this quantification. And not all of it is as simple as I've made it sound. So. I'll let uh, Christina describe some of the uh, thinking she's been doing on this. Uh, say eight minutes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dick. Um, so I've, um, at the International Energy Agency, worked with colleagues at the OECD, um, and we do work for a group called the Climate Change Expert Group, which is group of negotiators from developed and developing countries who meet twice a year um, and talk about technical issues to do with the negotiations. So we wrote a series of papers starting actually in 2011 um, up until 2015 looking at what, what might markets look like, what might accounting look like in some future regime, um, you know, the post-Kyoto regime. And I guess the, our concept of that got clearer as time went on and we got more information about what the Paris Agreement might look like. But um, so there are, for those who are interested in more detail, there's a, a series of quite detailed papers from the past that I can point you towards on this or that particular issue. Um, so Dirk uh, said, as Dirk said, this is about the quantification of NDCs. So I wanted to focus specifically on that point. You know, is it necessary? to quantify NDCs in, that, in order to be able to account for at most. So um, my answer is yes and no, or yes but. <laughs> um, as as um, Dirk said, it's maybe not quite as simple. So certainly if you want to be able to account for something quantitative, you have to be able to count and see how things add up. So there's certainly quantification needed you know, somewhere in the process. Um, you could say that accounting for an NDC is the process of comparing your emissions level with a target level, taking into account the kind of unit flows that have happened or the ITMO flows that have happened. So in order to be able to do that accounting, you need to know your emissions in a certain unit. You need to know the ITMO transfers in hopefully the same units and have a target which is also quantified in the same <coughs> units. So that is to say using the same global warming potentials or so on, because otherwise it gets complicated if you try and add and subtract and things are not in the same basis. So there's clearly um, you know, a very fundamental at level at which you do need um, quantification. But that process that I just described could be ex post. It could be something that happens after the end of the NDC period. So. We've had a bunch of trading and a certain number of ATMO flows have happened. We look at what the emissions were. We add all that up and compare it to the target level. So that could be that um, the, the target level really only needs to be quantified at the end, if you think about it that way. And it could, for example, the target level could, for example, still be a range. It could be quantified, you know, my target because of because my target was conditional, because I expressed as a, as a range in the first place, um, could end up being, well, it's between X tons and Y tons, and then you look at where you got to, and, you know, was I within my range or not? Um, so you could imagine it ending up that way. Now, there is a separate question, which is when might you want to or need to quantify before trading occurs? And this is where Dirk said you need to know um, you can't trade if you can't, if you don't know what you're trading, if you can't count it. Now, um, this to me is where I get into the yes but. So there's two quite separate situations as I see it. So one situation is where the thing that you are trading might actually be surplus in the NDC itself. So one country is overachieving its NDC, it's got some surplus, and it wants to sell that to another country. In that case, I would agree, absolutely, you need to know, you know, what your NDC means, you know, what is its quantified number, but you would also need to know, um, have confidence that you're actually going to be meeting the NDC, so that, you know, it, that you're not overselling. And <clears throat> as a separate environmental integrity question, you would actually want to know that the NDC was set 
um, in a robust way so that it's not a lot of hot air that's being sold. So there's certainly quantification needed in that case where you're going to be trading the NDC surplus itself, but the quantification is, isn't the whole story. It's necessary, but not, not sufficient. There's a, another situation though um, that could occur, it seems to, to us, seem to us with trading. And we actually think that this is, would probably be the bulk of what happens. And that's actually trading between mechanisms or use of units from mechanisms. So accrediting mechanism and ETS and so on. So this is what I think of when I see the language around cooperative approaches in the Paris Agreement. When you have that sort of a system, it's actually the, um, the rules of the system itself that give you, that tell you about the environmental integrity of the units and it tell you about the quantification. They tell you about how many units have been issued and what the baseline is and how that was derived. And, and so you can see that units are real and you know exactly what's going on. So it's giving the environmental integrity, the quantification, and it's also giving the um, the, the infrastructure for supporting that, such as the registries and so on, are all part of those, those mechanisms themselves. So in that setting, you can imagine that you would have high quality units because the, the mechanism that they're coming from has got really robust baselines and good governance and good review and all of that stuff. Um, quite separate from what the national NDC looks like. So you could have a very good mechanism, high quality units in a country that has an NDC that's full of hot air or is not clearly defined and is not well quantified, is only for a single year instead of a carbon budget and so on. So um, you can, that's something I think that we need to take into account. So why would you not accept units from a system like that, even if the national NDC is, you know, not, not ideal? You could also, I would say, you can also have um, emission, real emissions reductions arising from a system like the one I just described, even if the host country is failing to meet its NDC. So you can imagine that overall in other parts of the economy, the, the host government is, is not doing such a great job on policy and emissions are rising more than they thought it would, so it's missing its NDC target. But within the part of the economy where this mechanism is running, things are going really well. You know, it's got robust baselines, emissions are really being reduced. These are gen the, the units represent genuine reductions. So to me, you also have to be careful. I know that some people talk about saying, oh, well, you shouldn't be allowed to use units if a country <coughs> isn't meeting its NDC. I think you need to separate the questions of what is it that's... Um, determining the quality of the units. Is it the rules of the mechanism or is it the NDC itself? So in cases where it's the mechanism, then, then just look at the mechanism. Um, so, um, you know, that leads to, you know, a bunch of other questions, of course, around if the mechanism is so critical, then how do we ensure that the mechanisms really are any good? What do the governance arrangements around that look like? Is there going to be international review or oversight or whatever? So there's cer certainly a lot to be worked through there. Um, just, I wanted to mention just finally, if you wanted um, a, a little bit more very basic detail on this, I did a workshop with <coughs> some climate negotiators in Ottawa back in February where we actually did some worked examples of this kind of thing. So looked at just sort of toy examples of trade between party A and party B in the context of different NDC types and just to see kind of how, how it would work out. Now, I um, don't have any hard copies of the workshop report, but if you're interested, you can come and ask me and I'll email it to you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. <coughs> and you managed to get away without exactly saying what was robust, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. And um, Ulrika, um, I already introduced you before you came in. You but knew I was going to come, right? I knew you were going to come. I, I have faith, full faith and confidence in you. But um, uh, I'm, I'm also conscious that you uh, have a negotiator badge on, and I know how that goes. So I sort of feel like I had a call on you next just in case you get called away. <laughs> Uh, would you like to go next, or have you caught your breath? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I'm sorry I was late. 
I, I feel like a very bad student because I read the questions in this heading for this um, session, this side event, and I felt if this was an exam in school, I would probably not pass. I don't know the answers to these questions. Um, I probably didn't take the preceding <clears throat> course or didn't do that well enough to to get to the very detailed on, on quantification because I'm, I'm somewhat earlier in my thoughts and my progression, but uh, being after Christina, I feel somewhat encouraged because right now I'm reading a lot of what she has written and other uh, academic reports trying to read up on, on, uh, on the topic. Um, I'm working at the Swedish Energy Agency and we've had a program for international climate change cooperation since 2000. And we had the CDM and JI program. Before that, we had an AIJ program, if anyone remembers that far back. Um, but we've been doing projects in other countries uh, under the CDM mainly, uh, not for compliance purposes, but for the dual purpose <coughs> of contributing to combating climate change, but also try to develop mechanisms as tools for international cooperation. And we're still on the that mandate, and we are now looking into Article 6 and see what kind of creature is this, and, and how would you engage in international cooperation um, under Article 6, and what would it look like? And we've been trying to approach this from different angles. We commissioned research reports. Uh, we have some authors here in the audience. And, and we go to seminars with the CCXG, and we try to read up on what Christina's written. And we try our hands on it as well. Uh, we recently started an initiative together with Norway, Switzerland, Germany, the UK and Canada called Transformative Carbon Asset Facility. The trustee is the World Bank, um, but this is very much initiative by some countries that actually want to try to do things together. So we're trying to do pilot activities under Article 6. And the idea is that, of course, if we work together, we can jointly do more. Um, um, it's just a matter of finding the forms for it. So we're trying on hands on Article 6. And we'll look at specific activities where we could engage. We have some money to put on the table. Um, we won't wait until the rules have been fully elaborated. But we hope to try our hands on uh, activities together with other countries and bring back whatever we learn, good and bad, into this process and to help to develop the rule book. And then, of course, you look at NDCs. And eventually, we will get to the quantification of them. Um, but, but first, you look at them, and you wonder, where's the entry point? Where could we engage? Um, what would be the good country to cooperate with? And we, we agree that this also needs to be someone who's quite ambitious. But how do we know if someone is ambitious? Um, can you? question about the NDCs? Is it ambitious? Um, uh, are you allowed to find some metrics of making your own assessment on it? Um, how do you find a good area to cooperate? You probably can't take on a whole NDC for implementation. For a piloting activity, you might actually pick one area, one sector. And then you look at the NDCs and you find that although everyone has them, um, they're not really that detailed, a lot of them. Um, they're not broken down on sectoral <coughs> level. And even if they are, there is room in, for interpretation and the different underlying assumption and even different global warming potentials. So sometimes there's a lot of things that actually vary. Um, and if you pick a sector, if you manage to define something that is something of a sector, uh, and, and you kind of break down the NDC to, to roughly cover that sector, um, there are also interlinkages between sectors, and the one you picked for a good pilot activity uh, might be linking to something else that's completely outside any NDC, and, and they might correspond with each other. So you take action in one area and something happens in the other one. And, 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 and that is actually the starting point or where I am right now together with my colleagues. That's where we're having the discussion. So it's more like we are on the topic on where to draw the borders of the universe we're considering in, in the pilot activities. And, and, and I think as a next step, we will get into quantification, um, but actually defining what we're looking at. So, so we're not really at your advanced questions yet, Jeff. Sorry about that. But... But these are the areas we're looking into. And I can say some lessons I've learned is that 
if you look at the point from the Swedish taxpayer, you want to put in money where it makes a difference, um, which also poses a question of kind of additionality, um, but more from the investor's perspective, where do our money make a difference or what would have happened anyway? Um, you're concerned about quality, and one risk that has been highlighted here is that, that the host country, who is very ambitious, might not want to sell off credits. Well, that's a risk, but there's also risk as a donor or a financier or as a buyer, use whatever word you want. Um, you don't want to engage in something where you will be later to be blamed that that wasn't very ambitious, that was actually a lot of crap, it was hot air. So, so you do want to, to ensure quality and somehow. And, and in my experience, it doesn't really help just to say that this is conditional or this is unconditional, this is inside the NDC or this is outside the NDC. You still get to the point where you want to know more and you want to go down into number crunching somehow to find out what would be the likely development in this area. Uh, where can I make an intervention and how would that development then change? And would that change be permanent or would it be just a one-off thing? That's another question. If you look at the NDCs, they cover a fairly short period and they will be updated. Great. They will be more ambitious over time. Also great. But also that means that you have a moving target. If you quantify an NDC, that's a snapshot of reality at a certain point in time. Uh, although that point in time might be five years. But that's still pretty short if you're aiming at 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees at the end of the century, which is a bit longer time frame, and you want to have a trajectory where you're heading in the right direction also in the long run. So you're looking for an activity that you will probably put some money on the table and you will probably acquire some ITMOs that will probably be generated within a NDC-like <clears throat> time frame, crediting period if you want to call it that, but it should also give a development that in the long run leads on a low carbon development path on a good trajectory towards 1.5 or 2 degrees on a global level. And that's pretty tall order. So there are many parameters that come into play and quantification certainly will get to that point and it is crucial, but it's not the only one. Um, <clears throat> that might even be the easier part of the problem. Um, the uh, geographical or the economical boundaries you draw for your activity and the time period you are considering um, are equally important <clears throat> and perhaps much trickier to get to grips with. Um, wow. That probably doesn't sound very optimistic. I was determined to sound, on a, to sound off on a positive note, so I'll tell you about... Um, what we've been considering doing is actually to, to look together not only on the NDCs but also on the LEDs for countries and, and kind of try to get a grip on this um, very elusive aspect of transformative change. And also said in TCAF, this transformative carbon asset facility when we're working together with prospective host countries or implementing countries that we would probably use the time frame also to our advantage and say that we will do something together that has a certain longevity, um, kind of sustainability or a long trajectory. And there will probably be uh, the uh, uh, purchase of ITMOS from the beginning of this longevity or this activity that takes on for several years. Um, but there will be a transition. So the kind of financing or the, the buying of ITMOS will be the beginning of a long story. But this will actually be taken over by the host country and the continued implementation in the longer run will be on the host country side. So that is kind of a split you can do in time um, to try to get over this kind of gap of the NDCs being quite short. And also, if you look at the outside of the NDCs, well, what's outside now might not be outside forever if you have better data, um, which you might actually get if you sell the credits to someone abroad, you might get a better measuring system, you might get a better data, and you might get a better confidence of wanting to include it yourself in your future NDC. So I hope that was fairly positive, at least the intention is to fairly be positive. Thank you, Ulrika, and trans transformation is always, you know, it's always challenging, but 
also always inspirational too. So, um, so it will be interesting to hear the results of uh, of some of those investments as that um, new initiative gets underway. So, um, I want to bring in a, a, a slightly different perspective now, which is Andrew. I'm coming to you, so get ready. Uh, to get Andrew Howard, uh, who should be no stranger to uh, to folks in this room, but Andrew, uh, until fairly recently, ran uh, the mechanisms unit here. Uh, has a long history with it. Ran the negotiations uh, uh, here at the FCCC, but now is uh, in private practice with Koru Climate, his consulting firm. Um, has do, been doing a lot of thinking about. He's one one of the many authorities that have been involved in running one of the systems in the past. Uh, but to bring some of the lessons of that and think about what might be uh, uh, good structures for the future. So, Andrew, the floor <coughs> is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Dirk. Um, at the outset, I have to say I, I, I talked this morning on accounting already, so I actually thought I would avoid that topic here and, and pick up on um, some other parts of, of the, the, the topic, trying to be a good student. Um, you but can do transformation because that's what Ulrika did. So. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> rapidly change plans and stick a little bit. Um, so I, but I wanted to give a few thoughts on, on where the show might go in, in the sort of medium long term. I, I, and and I, I guess that's partly because it's pretty hard to say at the moment. Uh, I think we're in a phase which is, I hope, uncharacteristic in, in the in the medium term already, you know, we're at a stage where there's lots of ideas on the table, uh, everyone's throwing them around. It's all quite abstract and conceptual, and there's lots of people throwing jargon around. And I don't know how familiar people are in in this room with the with the jargon, and and I guess it is quite normal at the moment. It, it is very much in the form of stages, and you know, I think we told ourselves shortly after Paris that um, we're doing this the second time round now. We did the Marrakesh Accords, we did Kyoto, and this one should be easier. But, I, but I'm, I'm not sure it is necessarily uh, easier to um, create a building from a previous building uh, than it is actually to build it from scratch. You know, there's a, there's a renovation going on here as opposed to a pure new new build, and that's not always uh, quite so so simple. So we're in a stage where I think it's difficult to see where uh, things are going to go forward. So I wanted to give um, a, a, a few thoughts on that. Um, so you know, I'm going to go on the wire a little bit and and say that I kind of expect this current phase that we're in, the sort of uncertain phase, to keep going uh, probably until around 2021. Now, I don't know if that's pessimistic or optimistic. I don't think it's going to be a black and white situation. I don't think we're you're going to have the current sort of uncertainty right out until 2021. But I think it will take uh, us a little bit into the first NDC period to really get a, a more comfort on, on where all this is. Um, and I, I think as well that you know we should have the rules according to the schedule. We should have the rules for Article Six by the end of next year. Um, but of course, from that point, some of the uncertainty that we're currently experiencing around the Article Six rules will actually just migrate into uncertainty uh, within the rules which the governing board for the Article Six Four mechanism is developing within the rules that governments are developing at, at a national level. So. You know, I think it is going to take a little bit more time before things things really settle down. But I think through that time, we will be seeing um, an emerging picture of of the way Article Six and cooperation and markets uh, will look. So, you know, some thoughts about what it might look like in 2021, give or take a year or two. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's. There's certain milestones which will have been met. We we will have had the the rules for Article Six by that point. That's going to be a major milestone. As I said a moment ago, that's 2018 if all goes well. Um, we'll also have seen that the the Paris Agreement will have started at that point, um, and countries will have made more progress and become more comfortable in what they're actually going to do under their NDCs. Um, because as Ulrika was just saying, a lot of the NDCs are not very precise at the moment. Um, so it's going to take a bit more time for those countries to go through those planning activities and have their um, plans also for their um, cooperative approaches themselves under Article 6.2 to have those to have those in place. Um, you know, Ulrika just mentioned the um, low emission development strategies as well, and I, I think that is also going to be hopefully a space where countries can get a 
better, a clearer picture of their long-term strategy for how they're actually going to get onto a, a low uh, emissions path. So um, there's going to be more as well. I think you know there's currently quite a lot of uncertainty around how Article Six, how markets uh, connect into the climate finance world. You know we're experimenting around that at the moment. Ulrich has just talked about some examples. And you know, there again, I, I think we're going to get much more clarity within the next couple of years. And I think things like this will become uh, much more normal in, in the way we think about the way um, countries are cooperating and the way that can be supported. Um, uh, and the other thing I'd mention is Corsia, the the ICAO, the International um, Civil Aviation uh, Trading, uh, which is going to be taking place. Um, that is expected to kick in with some demand in the next um, you know, few years. And you know, I think that is going to take a little while to ramp up, but I think we'll start to see the impact of that in around this period of you know, up and from here up until uh, 2021. So there's a number of things which we'll be developing. And you know, my personal perspective is, and you know, I've, I've just recently come out of the UN, so my perspective is perhaps a little bit different. But, um, I, I'm actually feeling quite optimistic that despite all the uncertainties we currently have, this, this sort of thing is going to be gradually taking shape and we'll have a much clearer idea in the next couple of years, and in particular just after the, the Paris Agreement really kicks in. Um, so, you know, what do I think that's going to look like in terms of the space that we have for Article 6 and for carbon markets and more generally for the kind of cooperation which governments are going to be doing? You know, the first thing I'd mention is I think there's a lot of governments who are already uh, committing themselves to the kinds of things that we're already reasonably familiar with. So emissions trading schemes, uh, crediting systems. I, I do, I mean, this is just a, a comfort level. I, I do see that that sort of thing will become the, the, the core of where Article 6 is going. Um, so I think the country's already committed to that sort of thing. Um, and I think a lot of that is going to be um, driven and to some extent also held back by the demand situation that we've got. You know, it is going to take years for the demand to really kick in. Um, but I, I think uh, even before the global stock take, which is supposed to happen in 2023, we'll also we'll be seeing signals of uh, where governments are much clearer uh, about what they want to do, and they'll have, they'll be giving stronger signals of of demand. I think already before two thousand twenty three. So you know, I, I'd I'd like to sort of throw out three predictions for um, characteristics of of this market as it goes forward. Um, the first one is, I think that uh, I think pragmatism will start to come back, uh, and I, I think you know where we're currently at. It's as I said before, it it is seeming very abstract and you know we're very much in a political mode where countries are very very interested in national determination and they want the flexibility to be able to implement what they want to implement um, I think um, you know that is in many ways a throwback to the much more sort of rigid structure that we had within the Kyoto Protocol um, but I, I think that given another year or two uh, there will be quite a lot of pragmatism coming back into that and I think one of the uh, one of the manifestations of this will be quantification uh, it is I think the easiest way to show results whether you're private sector or whether you're a government uh, it's the easiest way to show how much you're achieving and to be able to compare your achievements to the other people who are competing for the same funds as you are so I do see that quantification will be um, quite uh, clearly uh, on the table in that. And I think the other word I'd throw in there is harmonization as well. I, I think um, we will see more of a move um, in the next few years towards uh, countries beginning to say, well, you know, it, it's great to have the freedom to do what I want to do, but uh, actually I really want to be able to do that with other countries. And I, I want to be able to do that with the private sector, which is uh, knowing the rules of the game. And I, I, I think that there will um, be more of a drive towards uh, some more commonality between the rules and the infrastructure that you uh, is shared across countries. And I think, you know, some of the examples of that are going to be things like um, the MRV rules of of crediting systems, in particular um, methodologies, 
some of the things that we're familiar with already. I think I can see some of these things coming through again, um, accreditation, so the third party verification, all of these things. I, I think this this could well be a kind of a modular structure which is developing where some of these services are actually provided from one place and could be used by multiple countries in, in the market systems that they're putting in place. So um, more pragmatism uh, and more harmonization, I, I think, would be uh, where, where it's going. And I think uh, we're already starting to see signs of that. You know, I think I'd highlight one example um, within the negotiations. There's more and more countries who are actually saying, well, you know, uh, in Paris, we left open the route to be able to transfer any kind of um, metric, you know, a mitigation outcome in any kind of metric we want. Um, but in actual fact, we're all really interested in CO2 equivalent. So I, I, I do see that that's one sign of, of where we'll be heading. Um, second prediction is, um, I think, with CDM activities, I, I think some of them, um, going on the line here, I think some of them will actually find their way into Article 6. I think some of them will find their way into the Article 6.4 mechanism. Um, probably the bulk of those that do actually migrate will probably end up there. Um, and I think there may also be some which find their way into some cooperative approaches, some crediting systems which are run by national governments um, under the 6.2, the Article 6.2 framework. Um, I don't know how many it's going to be. Um, obviously, their uh, countries are very aware that the more CDM activities that are brought in, uh, the more that diluting the already rather scarce ambition that we have within the NDC period from 2020 onwards. So uh, I'm not saying it'll be a lot, but I do think that the governments will actually go through a process of saying to themselves, okay, which are the kinds of mitigation activities uh, which are really going to help us kickstart Article 6, um, which ones are going to bring in scale and bring in volume and a, and a fairly quick pace, and which uh, ones are going to benefit the, the way that markets move forward. Um, so there may well be a selection of certain types. Um, those kinds of decisions are always very difficult to make in the politics of this place. Um, so maybe there won't be a selection of different policy, uh, different activity types, but maybe there'll be an approach to bring more of them in, but to allow them to credit less within the new system. So there could be some sort of discounting arrangement which is applied to C CDM activities which do come in. And um, I know that one of the topics on the table is to what extent uh, reductions from CDM, which are already happening now, before 2020, how many of those could come in? So the recognition of early action. And, uh, and I think um, here, I think countries will probably be very cautious. Uh, you know, I, but I think that there could well be um, some early recognition, early, a recognition of early action given to some of those projects where, which are deemed eligible to get into Article 6 in one fashion or the other. So, um, you know, I, at the same time, what we're seeing more and more clearly is that uh, it's uh, given the amount of um, demand, the amount of energy that there'll be in the crediting kind of market around that time, it's probably worth trying to concentrate that within the crediting processes under uh, Article 6. Um, and I can imagine the CDM itself, as we know it today, would be coming to an end. Um, and as I say, those projects and programs would be getting into Article 6 um, where they're allowed in. So my, my third and final prediction is um, uh, is that there may be um, more of a, a radical change in the way we look at what constitutes a, a project or an activity. Certainly, I think there'll still be space for a kind of traditional idea of, a, of an activity or a program of activities. And, and certainly, we'll be looking at whether sectors and crediting at sectoral level can come in as well. But I, um, I think one of the issues that, uh, the, that the crediting world at least will need to deal with is whether um, it's necessary that there should be uh, a, uh, a market funding which justifies an entire activity. Um, you know, maybe what we'll be looking at more is that uh, the, the market funding tweaks the direction of other investments, of other activities which are going on already, and perhaps giving an incentive to, to those other existing 
investment streams to change the direction that they're taking, rather than uh, trying to uh, see an entire activity as being driven by a particular market investment and then needing to uh, identify particularly how the, the activity and the baselines and everything else work in that regard. So there may be a slight, at least for some parts of um, the crediting, uh, there may be a slight relaxation of the kind of mar current mode of, of work and to, to think more about how these kinds of market um, finance issues um, can contribute along with a mix of other um, efforts and, and finance to, to bring about a quite significant mitigation. Um, so, uh, you know, I could imagine that there'll be more along the lines of um, private and public partnerships. Um, you can probably see governments themselves getting more into government to government uh, uh, cooperation and then bringing in market funding in order to to be an extra complement to that in order to to leverage and make the whole um, mitigation activities much more effective than they would have been otherwise so you know I, I think maybe we'll be looking at the kind of quite a new paradigm for the way we do markets and and perhaps in a in a less strict way from what we've seen so far so there's just some thoughts on how we may be going forward great <clears throat> thank you andrew um so i want to uh and that's that's really useful perspective and took the risk of actually making some predictions so thank you for that um i'm going to ask patrick berge uh from south pole carbon to go next and and uh, Patrick is going to bring a perspective of a company that's actually been in these markets for a long time. It's developed a lot of project and projects and can kind of give a window on at least uh, how the project developer community is viewing this stuff now. So Patrick, the floor is yours. Eight minutes, right? Yeah, that'd be good. Thanks, Dirk. So as Dirk, uh, oh, and I have some slides, yeah. probably one of the few ones. Uh, um, yeah, so for, for those of you who, who don't know uh, the South Pole Group, we started in 2006 as a CDM project developer and uh, diversified quite a bit uh, since then. We had to diversify because the market collapsed, uh, basically. And one of the many things we're doing today uh, is public advisory. Uh, and what we have been doing lately is to leverage our experience with the CDM, also voluntary carbon markets, to try to pilot activities under Article 6. So right now we're working for a project uh, with EBRD and, and the Spanish government where we are developing um, a CDM-based um, crediting mechanism in Northern Africa. Uh, and the idea would be to uh, do this under the CDM uh, in a scalable way using uh, POAs, uh, issue credits already pre-2020, and then find ways for the country to embrace that crediting mechanism post-2020. That could be either in the form of integrating that into domestic climate uh, policy. So as we see in South Africa, a linkage of a carbon tax to a, a, an offsetting scheme. Uh, maybe they could use it for Corsia, so to generate credits and then sell it under Corsia. Or another option would be to take this CDM-based mechanism and convert it to, into something uh, under Article 6. Um, on top of that, we are also in discussion with other mainly developed country governments uh, in, in very initial stages of, let's say, brainstorming about pilot activities, and they are going through a similar uh, learning curve uh, that Eureka uh, just mentioned. So it's uh, very interesting, a lot of speculation at the time, um, because the rules are not clear. But I think based on our experience, uh, we have a, a huge wish list of things uh, about Article 6 and how it should look like uh, if it should attract uh, the private sector. Next one. Um, so yeah, so here I'll focus mainly on three points. Uh, the role of the private sector um, to, to raise ambition. Lessons learned from some of the existing market mechanisms. And then I'll uh, end with some concrete recommendations for Article 6. And the work I'm presenting here today is part of a publication for, uh, for this EBRD Spanish uh, project, and it will be online in the coming days. So there is a link at the end of the presentation if you're interested, have a look at it. I, will, I think I'll bombard you with uh, a bit too much information. Uh, so if you are interested and would, have, would like to have a closer look, um, 
have a look at the link uh, at the end. So um, why do we need the, the private sector? So first of all, if we look at the commitments in all NDCs, uh, we are on a path to go for a temperature increase of 2.7 to 3 degrees. So we need increased ambition in order to meet the 2 degree or 1.5 uh, degree target. Next one, please. And if we look at the level of investment required, um, this is information from the International Energy Agency. Um, it is estimated that we will need in the energy sector alone about $1 trillion um, a year uh, in investments. Going from the current investment level, which, is the, 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 which are the red bars of about um, three to 400 uh, um, uh, billion uh, a year, so we need a massive ramp up in, in investments over the next uh, 15 years. Um, and the $100 billion uh, dollar figure that, that was committed under Paris is just a drop in the ocean. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it will get us somewhere if we manage to leverage at least 10 times more private money than is coming from this uh, mainly public commitments under the UNFCCC. So I think the message is very clear. Without finance from the private sector, we won't be able to achieve um, a two-degree target. Whether and how this money, I mean, wh where this money comes from will depend mainly on how the countries implement their NDCs. So I think a lot will be about how countries design domestic policies and incentivize the, the, the private sector in their own jurisdictions to, to make investments. But some of it can also be linked to international mechanisms. Next slide. So um, probably many of you are familiar with the last study by the World Bank on the states and trends of, of carbon pricing. Uh, in this study, they have estimated that um, carbon markets could help countries reduce the costs of um, their NDCs by about 33% by 2030 and even 50% by 2050. So there is a, a very strong economic argument speaking for markets and cooperative approaches, which will help us to achieve the, 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 the Paris Agreement goal at a lower cost. How, this only works, of course, if, if markets are effective, uh, if we have environmental integrity and, and so on. So this, I think it, it's a huge opportunity. But I also agree with other speakers that well, we, we are we're seeing right now huge challenges in designing these rules. Um, and I see a lot more complexity related to the Paris agreements and this NDC world uh, as we had under the Kyoto Protocol, which was comparably a fairly simple kind of uh, system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for this study, we looked a little bit into lessons learned from existing market mechanisms. Um, the CDM has been extremely successful in mo mobilizing the pr private sector due to the open access of, of the mechanism. So uh, under Paris, we see a tendency more towards government to government than the, the talks and, and, and engagement. But in the context of Article 6, we would have to think about how can we mobilize and catalyze the private sector as it happened under the CDM. Uh, which was very successful with more than 10,000 projects uh, registered. One thing that we struggled with under the CDM was policy certainty and price stability. So uh, it was a learning by doing mechanism. Uh, the CDM executive board was changing the rules as we moved along, which was good, uh, but also difficult for, for market participants. So the more policy certainty we can have, the better. This will also help us to address the, the, uh, the challenge that Ulrika mentioned, this long-term perspective. Price stability is also a big issue. Um, and I think if you look at the UETS or the CDM market, I think some thinking around how can we ensure price stability in the long run is, I think, worth uh, consideration to make sure that the private sector has certainty and, and will make the required investments. Um, also, we had many lessons learned ar around transaction costs and, let's say, uh, a move towards standardization, um, more scalability through programmatic approaches. I think this is the way to go. We have to move away from the project by project, um, let's say, uh, 
ap approach uh, that we had on the CGM to a, a more scalable uh, solution. One of the most contentious things we had under the, the CDM was additionality. And when people talk about additionality in the context of Paris Agreement, how to distinguish between activities that are part of the conditional NDC versus the unconditional part of the NDC, then uh, I, I get very nervous because uh, it was super, super difficult to deal with additionality already under the CDM. And I would say, if there is something that we should avoid in the future, it's this kind of very sub subjective approach to, to additionality. We need uh, a more standardized and an objective approach. Um, and another thing, I think an important lesson learned, the, the reputation of the CDM uh, suffered a lot by not having, let's say, harmonized social and environmental uh, safeguards. I think it damaged the reputation of the market as a whole. And now when we talk about sustainable development, we have the same thing that happened under the Kyoto Protocol. The developing countries saying, we want to define sustainable development and we will deal with that based on our national policies. But if we don't have, um, let's say, uh, safeguard principles on a global level and some kind of accountability, we might have the same problem with these new mechanisms under Article 6. Um, JI, I, I won't go into details about the others, but uh, for JI, I think it's, we can see many lessons learned for, especially for Article 6.2. And the fact that when countries agreed bilaterally on the rules, um, the, yeah, the, the environmental integrity behind the projects was, let's say, uh, questionable uh, at best. So this, I think, poses some big challenges for 6.2 and how to make sure that a ton is a ton and, and we're really trading emissions uh, or, or reductions um, under Article 6.2. Next slide, please. So. Um, Green investment schemes are also interesting. This relates to AAU trading, um, especially between, let's say, Western Europe and Eastern European countries. And there, the, those trade of emissions at, from, at the national level, which could be comparable to some kind of in, ITMO transaction, they were often linked to non-market mechanisms um, as well. So I think it might be interesting to look at it again and see what have we learned uh, from these green investment schemes in the past. Voluntary carbon markets are also, I think, an important source of knowledge, um, especially when it comes to sustainable development. There were many uh, standards like the gold standard, the social carbon, the CCBS, that pioneered the, let's say, standards around quantification of sustainable development impacts. And I think a lot of these lessons learned could be, uh, trans uh, let's say, transferred to the Paris Agreement. Next one, please. So um, when we thought about um, recommendations for the Paris Agreement, uh, we were looking at it from a private sector perspective and came up with a range of, let's say, criteria that we would regard very important as very important, and then started mapping how do these criteria relate to some of the main topics under the, the, the Article 6, like, for example, governance, accounting, uh, overall mitigation, sustainable development, um, and in the in the blue, so on the blue side of the chart, you see the the kind of things that the private sector would like to have, like certainty, accessibility, simplicity, efficiency, um, then autonomy, impact, integrity, and, and sustainable development. So it, it looks very easy, but uh, yeah, the devil is in the detail. How to you know uh, flesh out the rules that will make everybody happy, including the private sector, is a, is a huge challenge. And I would say, in my opinion, Andrew's prediction of 2021 is uh, still very optimistic. So I I would give it uh, I would push it even further back. Um, um, and we. So these are my final slides. Uh, we came up with 20 recommendations. So I won't be able to go through all of them in, in detail. Uh, they will be in this publication. And they s read a little bit like a wish list from, from a private sector perspective. And I will just highlight a couple of them. So um, we need policy and price stability to achieve effective carbon prices. 
<clears throat> we need a sufficient degree of standardization measures for determination of emission reductions. So if we look at baseline setting, MRV procedures, the more we standardize and the more we go from, let's say, uh, um, a system that can be easily scaled up and, and avoid the project by project and, and very subjective assessments, um, the better. In, under the CDM, um, it took sometimes about four years from, let's say, project registration to the first issuance or, or let's say the start of a project until someone got actually money from, from the CDM. So I think making sure that the lead times in, in these mechanisms are as short as possible would be also important. Uh, the migration of eligible CDM JI activities from uh, into Article 6 I think would be also important to, to consider. Provided, of course, we don't, you know, oversupply the market from day one and provided these projects fulfill certain basic criteria under Article 6. Um, and I think I would love to see an AIJ phase um, as we had before the CDM. Unfortunately, nobody's really talking um, about it. So I think we it would be good to, you know, try some pilots, um, experiment a little bit before we... Uh, flesh out all the rules. Uh, next, please. Um, so here on governance, I think a lesson learned from the CDM is if we have a governing body for Article 6.4, it would be great if these could be policy and technical experts that are independent, don't belong necessarily to, to a party, and that really are qualified for, for the job. Not to say that, you know, uh, the CDM EB is not qualified, but I think it would be best practice to have um, kind of independent um, experts. Um, so I think I'll skip um, a few. I think the, the topic of capacity building um, uh, is, is also very important and then we need to start that um, as soon as possible. Okay. Next slide. On accounting, um, I'm happy to hear that uh, it's going in the right, di right direction. At the COP, people were still talking about quantifying ITMOS in different units. In our opinion, we should stick to CO tons of CO2 and make it the, the global currency, a single currency. Otherwise, it becomes even more complex. Um, we um, should establish common accounting standards and procedures to ensure compatibility and connectivity of registries. So this is, I think, also a very challenging one, but ideally, at some point in time, we have a central transaction log where all these transactions are comparable and, and yeah, and we're not dealing with the apples and, and bananas. Um, and uh, point 13, the principle of seller liability. If a country sells uh, ITMOS, but is not really reaching its NDC, it should not be able to retract uh, those also, so make it, um, like, take the units back and say, uh, I, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, if the units are gone and transferred, they're, they're, they're gone. Um, next one. Um, so this is, I think, a tricky one. What happens to emission reductions outside the scope of an NDC? Um, in our opinion, these things should be, by definition, governed under international oversight, so ideally 6.4, for the sake of environmental integrity. Um, so, and now jumping to overall mitigation, if we apply exchange rates and discount rates, and that issue is, I think, highly debated, we need to make sure that we have certainty and predictability in the way these, let's say, discount rates are applied, uh, if any. Uh, and now moving to this last slide. On sustainable development, here I think it would be a huge opportunity to use the SDGs as some kind of a guiding framework. This is the first time 190 countries under the UN agreed on a definition of sustainable development and it would be great if we could use it. However, we should, you know, um, make sure that this doesn't, um, doesn't make the, the, the mechanisms too complex or, or too um, 
expensive in the application. So I have to find a way to do that. But referring to the SDGs might help us in harmonizing assessment of sustainable development. And on top of that, we would advocate for universal no harm safeguards to avoid the reputational damage uh, that we had under the CDM. And last but not least, uh, when it comes to the non-market approaches, uh, we would like these to enhance and, and complement the, the, the market approaches. So they shouldn't be completely detached. Ideally, they should try to find some synergies um, among each other. And, then, and here you see uh, a link. It's not online yet, so you have to wait a couple of days. Uh, but under the link at the very bottom of the slide, you'll see the publication with these 20 detailed recommendations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So um, we're going to get one more perspective, and then we're going to open the floor for discussion. So I hope you're thinking about some questions or comments that you'd like to make. But that was very useful to get a set of concrete uh, recommendations, Patrick. So thank you for that. Uh, so next, we're going to hear from uh, Werner Betzenbleckler, who is here with us from uh, the DOE forum. forum. Uh, the, the designated operational entities have been the provided the verification function that has really brought a lot of the veracity to the system as we've experienced it thus far. Uh, so Werner, it would be great to get your perspectives. And I think you have slides as well, so I'll click on. Yeah. Thank you. So if we go already to the first slide, so thanks for the invitation. And when I have been invited, so I wrote down some bullet points for some issues I want to discuss with you because most of my previous speakers have already touched a lot of things <laughs> and there are only a few remaining aspects uh, with relevance for the DOEs, uh, the ones who are also busy in this market besides the project developers or investors or financiers or whomsoever. So uh, what are our views? So regarding similarities and differences in the from Paris Agreement to the pre Paris Agreement situation, so under Article 6 or so, from the first point of view, we are fine, we are very happy. So, DOEs are mentioned in the regulations. <laughs> so, maybe the individuals, they are jeopardized by the global warming, but we have a secure workplace <laughs> so and a work permit. So, that's not a problem. So, DOEs are required in the context of Article 6. But one question is already there. So, they are mentioning DOEs. But is this the same accreditation as we have under CDM? So we have seen that under CGI and CDM in history, we had two different accreditation until last year. So with doubling the costs last year, they unified this in one accreditation, in theory, allowing to run this with half the costs. In practice, there is no difference because GI is not any longer alive in this context. So, uh, but at least costs are saved for this accreditation. But if uh, Article 6 uh, requires an additional accreditation, then again, this might cause, for me, unnecessary additional transaction costs. So we see most of the elements in principle, also the Paris articles are not too long, already understood as being in 6.4, which means the people who are now doing validation verification services under CDM, GI, they should be competent also to work under 6.4. So I also have to warn you, so this group of people is strongly uh, decreasing. So because there is not a lot of work left, most of this is verifications now, some few validation of QAs. So I believe, meanwhile, this is less than 10% of the people we have seen in 2012. So uh, there are some new aspects in Article 6, especially already mentioned by the two ladies here on double counting, So, which requires additional modalities and procedures, new setup of regulations. There's also a risk that uh, if this is not, as we have seen, there are really important issues there and pitfalls there. Uh, if this is not uh, clearly ruled by the to be decided body, so we might face situation like we have seen in 2005, 2006, 2007, when there was 
DOE bashing <laughs> was called because let's say uh, this depends in the understanding of additionality and how to how to validate this concept. So this could this is also a risk then for the double counting issue. We see much more possibilities for complex approaches, uh, for example, including an ETS scheme as an Article 6 project or sectoral approaches, much more um, cross-sectoral approaches even. So the question is then, and also requires regulation, has to, this to be verified, validated by a single DOE, who is then the orderer, who is then the service provider, can a single DOE even manage to deliver in time such a service? Uh, without having some, let's say, fallback position for the following services once this order is done. <laughs> uh, so, again, something which needs to be ruled. So, with regard to the NDCs, so the sectors are like in the national communication, they have now to be regularly every five years to be estimated. So, national com uh, communication, national inventories, from the experience we have are on a very different are provided at a very different quality level so with also very different uh, levels of uncertainties and there is recently only a peer review process by let's say some experienced auditors international auditors uh, the question is whether this then expanding this process to 150 190 country are there enough resources or can this resources be amended by the private sector, private auditing companies? So this might be a chance for us. <laughs> uh, and how to ensure then that this, that there is always the quality in this process. Because if you go to many governmental authorities, let's say being responsible for inventories, there's a lot of change in this personnel and maybe they are not long enough in a position to assist this process also with the, the peer reviews uh, therefore this might create difficulties furthermore then if an individual sector is open for article 6 not necessarily the whole inventory then it's already has been presented a tier 3 approach in principle is is necessary for this sector which means then not only a single activity a project emission reduction project has to be assessed but all the interlacing have to be assessed uh, in order to collect data to ensure that there's let's say the emission reduction is correctly uh, transferred and and the correct emission reduction is transferred and and which means i do not know at this point of time if all these countries developing the ndcs are aware of that that they have to deliver Tier three approaches for sectors for which they, they want to open for 6.4. <laughs> right. Then on verification and accreditation regulations. So in inventories, I have already told that this is in principle an accreditation anyway is not required. It's a process between governments. Uh, the review and verifications are <laughs> considered as an element of quality assurance, quality control, with a different level, how it is really performed uh, in the different countries. So outside my function here as, as DOE representative, I worked on the first uh, independent re uh, verification of a national inventory from a private sector company. And I believe this was the first exercise globally. So one in this 20, 30 years Kyoto. <laughs> World. So, on um, there is also acceptance of a relatively high level of uncertainty, especially for some sectors. So, where uh, the uncertainty level is maybe twenty percent or more. Then, on sector-specific data, if it comes to let's say uh, objectives or targets within sectors, so to date there is no mandate for verifying total sectors besides the fact that they are a share of the of the national inventory so sometimes this is done by industry associations uh, most cases not verified uh, there's it is usually 
a compilation of in installation specific data, but in most cases, not all, in, not all installation data is available. So those uh, installations where no data is available, they can only be uh, uh, deliver can only deliver an estimation. So as told, there are no accreditation regulations for such aspects. And on the installation specific data, including project specific information, so there are regulations available, especially from ETS systems, EU ETS, other existing, meanwhile existing ETS systems on MRV systems like country of, like Turkey or Ukraine who have developed MRV systems, not yet training, but uh, already monitoring and reporting from CDM and GI, and also from some voluntary schemes as presented by Patrick. So they're all based on and they have all similarities to ISO 14064, 65. So also CDM GI has a lot of similarities to the ISO standards, but not completely the same. Uh, and the question is, can this international standard be transferred to a global scheme? We have seen in the EU test that it's quite complex to have this rec uh, mutual recognition of accreditation bodies, which is a challenging exercise. And if you do this on a global scale, it will be much more difficult than it is with, uh, among 28 countries. <laughs> so on Further challenges from the DOE views on the regulatory framework, which has to be developed. So these modalities and procedures are still missing. That's clear. That's nothing new. And they have to be applied then most likely under national legislation. So this might be a difficulty from, for many negotiators from many countries. But we have this issue of mutual acceptance. So if only two countries make a system jointly uh, jointly meeting their target. Um, so this have to be accepted maybe then finally by a third or many most other countries. And this is uh, unsolved so far. And furthermore, we have the open issue. What is preferred? Do we want to go with a global accreditation system like we have in CDMGI? Or where do we need a global accreditation system? Or do we want to have local accreditation systems? So we have seen in the CDM 10 years ago, many developing countries have tried to push to have own DOEs in the home country, while there was no market for DOEs to be developed in this country. So what shall I do with two projects in my home country, in my host country? Uh, they will not survive there. So also here, so now we have a maybe much more bigger market, a global market. So what is the best solution? Have it robust under a single supervisor or have a supervising system which ensures that it's robust enough, but maybe some, uh, maybe at a little bit lower level. <laughs> so. And finally, we have this transparency issue when some countries consider their national inventories and their national data as their private property or their country's property uh, and do not want to see foreign auditors, foreign verifiers, foreign reviewers whatsoever uh, assessing their inventories, assessing their sector data or even assessing their Article 6 projects. <laughs> So regarding capacities and, and human resources, so we see this requires some time. Recently, we made the experience with the maritime sector, the UMRV system and the uh, IMO data collection system. So this already started two years ago, spanning maybe three years until resources are developed. We will have a similar situation. So this is a, an experience time demand we have under almost every verification, auditing, and accreditation scheme. So if we have not yet, as told, we have not yet developed modalities and procedures, we will really face difficulties to start with this in 2020. <laughs> uh, and so, and especially as we have no ability at this point in time, the DOEs, 
to estimate how many resources we will require. And it is, is this a big market, a small market? And so, which means human resources development will not start earlier as Andrew told maybe 2018 earliest, <laughs> maybe later. So again, if this then should be rolled out in a big scale, we face difficulties to provide the services. And that is, thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Werner. Join me in giving all of the panelists a round of applause for a terrific set of commentary. So I think we can take, I, I don't think there's anything in this room after us, so I think we can take about 10 minutes for some questions and comments. And uh, what we'll do is do, uh, let's, let's start with a round of three. There are also going to be some drinks outside after, so that might discipline the length of your questions. So uh, we're going to use this catch box that has a microphone in it, so I'm going to throw it to the first hand that goes up. There's no hand going up. I shouldn't have said the thing about the drink. Oh! <laughs> Here, Jeff, you take it. Uh, toss it back there. Uh, you can just throw it back. <laughs> just throw it on back to the back. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, like I said, we'll take about three questions. He's going to forget the question by the time it gets back there. <laughs> Here we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Worth it. Thanks. It's great. Thanks for the presentation, it's very nice. Um, just really a couple of questions um, for the last presenter. I forgot your name, I'm very sorry. Um, my name is Ahmed al and I'm from the Saudi delegation. But just as a question, um, you mentioned that data collection, um, and you used something about the IMO, you mentioned about the International Maritime Organization. I think they've, they're undergoing their fourth uh, GHG study, which I think started back in about 10 years ago or something like that. So can you highlight some lessons learned for governments in terms of the data collection? And number two, I've seen a few CDM projects myself in my own country and others. This issue of uh, what you just mentioned about sensitivity of some of the data, and they don't want to share, for example, production or something like this. That, that challenge doesn't seem really, uh, you know, possible to go away, if I can use the word. If you're coming and want to give me some sort of ITMAS or CDM or anything, and you want my, me to open all my books, it might not be possible. Uh, do you see ITMAS or your new mechanism overcoming confidentiality issues? I'm not talking about disclaimers and confidential agreements. Okay, they're all valid, but we all think that maybe you can share it by somehow leaking somewhere. But is there any robust mechanism of not sharing uh, sensitive data for people or for agencies or for entities or for countries that want to approach this? And thank you very much, sir, for taking so much time. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Two great questions. Now, someone else have a question. We've got one up here, so I'm going to take, uh, uh, yeah, we got to somehow get that microphone up to the front of the room. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me give this a try. It is tossable. Yay! <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Okay, and uh, is there another question after this one? Or this dangerous missile takes off again. Okay, go ahead. Danger closed. Hello, Tobias Hunzai, Climate Focus. Um, thank you so much for an excellent set of presentations and speaking in terms of likelihoods in this time of uncertainty and uh, transition. And speaking of transition, coming from the experiences we've had with the CDM, and renovating that house, dealing with that kind of complexity. Um, also building new pilot schemes like um, the, um, sorry Ulrika, the TCAF, yeah, um, with the TCAF or with EBRD and, or other uh, transitional um, pilots like also with CDEF. Um, so we are building on that CDM experience also with the CDM infrastructure and assets. Um, but we also learned that with ITMO trading, for example, it can be done in bulk and it's gonna be steered on a national level. Also coming back to, to co-facilitator the PD forum on this, what will likely be the role of project developers in this if their core incentive, um, revenues from carbon trading um, will be, or at least 
a little bit of that certainty of that carbon trading will be taken away through national processes. It's uh, really something that I can't find an answer to right now. Simple set of questions. Uh, anyone else? We've got a blue box that uh, is okay. So uh, I'm going to ask then first, uh, maybe Werner, can, can you take on those two uh, questions related to verification and data? Yeah. Okay. Let's start with maybe something which is not clearly within this uh, topic of this uh, presentation on, on the IMO and, and, and the data collection system. So lessons learned from for governments, which maybe are also relevant then in, in the relation or in context of implementing new rules on accreditation and verification for a scheme like article under Article 6. So, um, yeah, we see difficulties in, in, in transferring EU decision into national legislation, for example, and also then uh, giving the competences to the authorities and deciding which authorities are, let's say, uh, targeted by, by a new rule. So, for example, in uh, the, we have to report or the, the, the verifiers have to deliver their reports to the EU commissions and to the flag state. Uh, and supervision of, of verifications is done by another authority, for example, in German, they, we have the flag state, which is under the Ministry of Traffic and Trans uh, Transport, and, and we have the authority, the Environmental Ministry, which is relevant for verification and, and for checking uh, the reports. So uh, there is not yet clear how this will, let's say, work and if there's any interference in this work. Also, let's say decision was made already two years ago. <laughs> uh, so we, for, for Article 6, we have to be clear if something has to be converted to national regulations. So it requires some time to get the national regulations running. And in worst case, maybe also a revision round is necessary. If lessons learned, we have seen this also from the CDM in, 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 uh, with the executive board in the beginning, that not everything works properly in the beginning. But we still have some, maybe then further five years in uh, NDC terms to get this improved. Regarding confidentiality uh, and if there's any robust mechanisms, so in CDM, GI, ETS, and so on, if you ever have, whenever you have private companies so you have a confidentiality contract is a part of your of your working contract with the entities so uh, and sometimes this is criticized because there's always uh, um, possibility that there are maybe too strong work between the orderer and the service provider this is especially let's say relevant in some if culture does not see really clearly sees a third party being independent. <laughs> uh, but uh, confidentiality is, uh, is, let's say, a standard, is one of the principles of auditing companies. And if this principle is failed, then there would be a possibility to bring this auditing company to the court. It's also an issue for accreditation and maybe a suspension or withdrawal of accreditation. So. I don't see that this is really an issue. Did you want to add to that question, or did you want to take the next one? I'll take the next one. Okay. Go. Okay. It's kind of strange, the only government representative taking the question about the private sector. Um, yeah, we, we do love the private sector, especially private sector money, because that means you don't need to go to the Ministry of Finance and convince them to put it on the next year's budget. So the incentive is certainly there to try to engage the private sector. Um, I, if I'm allowed to say, I think actually with CDM, that incentive was there if you want to engage private sector and tap into the ingenuity of the private sector and tr try to have someone source the abatement opportunities and find them for you that was the mechanism to do it with you had something on the shelf you could take a methodology and you can go out and search and if you found something you found worthwhile doing you could make a profit good business out of it um we're not in that world anymore we are in the world where we have built a Paris Agreement on the NDCs. We built it on countries putting forward their NDCs. 
And the incentive structure is not there for the private sector yet. It has to be developed. And I would say it probably has to be an incentive structure that is in place in the host country where the activity, mitigation activity is taking place. So I find that from a Swedish perspective, it's quite challenging to find an entry point for Swedish or European or developed country companies to say, okay, their money will be channeled into business opportunities. That also brings mitigation. That is a complicated issue. And we have commissioned so many reports on this and they come up with the answer, it's complicated. Um, we've been looking at it from a slightly different angle lately, and this is actually also in the discussion about doing things under Article 6 and piloting that. And then if you let go of the thought that this has to be Swedish companies or companies in your own country, and, and you build it more from the host country's perspective, you could possibly find a way where you would do, well, sorry for the articles now, but if you envisage that you introduce a policy and you say this is part of Article 6.2, it's overarching between the governments, but then in the host country, it will be incentivizing activities that will take place under 6.4. Then you might have something that actually has a similar structure to what you had in CDM. You will have the opportunity to find possibilities in the smaller area project that is kind of under the umbrella of something larger, but you still will have the kind of opportunity to find business opportunities in a smaller, more uh, confined project-like environment and still get something, well, probably money, in return for the mitigation you're providing. But it, it, it doesn't come spontaneous. It takes a lot of uh, crafting, and I'm not sure it will work. Uh, but nonetheless, we are now on this path when we're working through NDCs and, and, and government to government, which brings its own benefits. But certainly, we lost some of the things that we did have under the CDM. There is no point in denying it. Patrick, um, you're a project developer, so how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, we there is a lot of talk about building upon the CDM and learning from the CDM. And that applies also to myself. I mean, uh, many people, when they talk about Article 6, they have crediting systems in mind. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the bulk of transactions under Article 6 might actually come from linking emission trading schemes, right? Which I think is maybe the most likely scenario and the one that could probably issue the most volume. Um, so, and, and that's, I think, also a bit the challenge of Article 6. It has to cater to so many potential so many different things uh, so it's i think we are dealing with so much complexity at the same time uh, how we define ndcs what's the business as usual scenario in ndcs and then how do mechanisms at the domestic level link internationally are these crediting systems or emission trading schemes so uh, it's uh, it's very very complex um, and we to be very honest with you if we as a project developer, if you would have to bet on, let's say, significant trading going on under Article 6 um, in the form of crediting mechanisms, I I'm very sceptical right now. And we are just saying, let's wait and see. Uh, the rules have to be defined first. And my expectation would be that at the earliest in 2021, we will have you know, uh, some substance and could maybe prepare. Um, and the sad thing about this, and this applies to the private sector, uh, like companies like ours, but also the DOEs, also capacity in the DNAs of the host countries, a lot of the know-how that was built up under the CDM is already lost. And yeah, and I think we, if we would start to move now, maybe we could keep in place some of it, but I don't uh, think that that will happen anytime soon. And my hope would be that crediting would be in place soon and, and that mainly LDCs maybe could uh, benefit from it. So if we think of cookstove projects, water filter projects, all the things we're doing now in Africa under the CDM or voluntary markets, I s still see a huge potential for that. And my hope would be that we would see some of it under Article 6. One important thing to keep in mind is also the uncertainty we have on the Paris Agreement is also having repercussions outside Paris. If we look at Corsia, for example, or even voluntary markets, many people are you know, starting to ask, what do we do with double counting under Corsia or voluntary markets? And 
and uh, the uncertainty from Paris Agreement is now we are running a risk of really, um, let's say, uh, yeah, the demolishing basically voluntary markets because it's not clear how to deal with these questions and the buyers of voluntary credits, they are insecure. They don't know how to deal with it. Nobody can give them a straight answer. So we, we see that there's, a, that there's a huge threat also to business we are doing outside Paris. So we would, if there are any negotiators in the room, we would urge everybody to do it as quickly as you can and, and have some certainty. Otherwise, you know, the, all the experts will find jobs elsewhere. It's a good, good uh, point to close on. Thank you, Patrick. And um, not, not just the capacity of the people, but uh, it also takes time to put these projects together. I thought you made a really good point about that earlier and the lead time. And if negotiators are thinking about wanting supply in place in 2021 for Corsia, you need that signal well in advance of that to raise the money and get the approvals done. So this has been a, a great discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'd love to continue it informally. There are uh, drinks just outside, so please join us for a drink and join me in one last final applause for the panelists. Thank you. And, and the last thing is, oh, there's the there's the catch box. Uh, so we'll put that back. And if you want uh, information on uh, more information on Aida's views, uh, Jeff has some of our uh, recent papers on this. Thank you.